Thank you very much. It's nice to be here with you here this Sabbath morning. If you were at my house, we have a guest house where we have 12 guest bedrooms and we have four foot snow banks. <laughs> so it's nice to be with you here this morning, uh, not to have the snow and to be in this little bit warmer climate and also to feel the warmth of this congregation and all the hard work that's going into this presentation. It's, uh, I speak in many, many different churches and different places, but immediately I was inspired by just the uh, energy that I felt when I came into this church and all of the activities that are going into trying to make this program a success. And with that much activity, I know that this church is going to grow and be fruitful and do a fabulous job. This morning, to start off our whole series, because we're going to actually have four parts to this series, we're going to have a, a lecture here during Sabbath school, and I guess we won't call the sermon a lecture, but we'll have a lecture during sermon, and we're going to have one this afternoon, and then we're going to have one this evening. So for those of you who are really going to be in with me and enjoying this whole series, there's going to be four parts to it. But to start off, I'd like for you to take your Bibles and look at 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. So we're going to start off with a, a thought. It's just going to give us a little thought. It's 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. And it starts off with a story about Naaman. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man. It sounds like it's uh, still going on over there in the Middle East. They still have armies. And it, this story is about the, the, the uh, commander of the army of the king of Syria. And he was an honorable man in the eyes of his master because of him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was what? What else was he? He was a leper. And uh, during one of these raids, they had gone into this area in Israel and they'd taken back a captive, a little girl. And this little girl was working for her mistress and doing her job and she would notice that her master who had leprosy and she saw the sadness and the, and, the, and the sorrow that was taking place in that home and she said, oh, if he could only go to Samaria and, and meet the prophet in Samaria and they would just think what would happen. And so um, Naaman took this to heart. His wife probably did a little working on him. I find that the health guests, the men that come to our guest house, it's because their wives have been working on him. You know, this is, this is why the men come. The women come, but the men come because their wives. But anyway, his wife must have worked on him, and he decided to send. What did he send to the king of Israel? So he sent 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothes. He sent them to the king of Israel, saying, I want to get healed from leprosy. And the king of Israel, what did he do? Says he tore his clothes. You know, this guy was trying to pick a fight. I mean, I don't heal lepers. I mean, I want to go to war. I could, you know, but this is, how do you heal lepers? And so he tore his clothes. And if you go down to verse 8, Elisha said, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there's a what? There's a prophet in Israel. Please let him come to me, and, and, and he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. And so the king of uh, Israel sent a message over to Name and he says, go down to Samaria and see prophet Elisha and he'll take care of you. And so here comes this uh, mighty man of valor, commander of the army, you know, with all of his entourage and he comes over to Elisha and he rides up in, in state with all of the finest gar garb and chariots and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Elisha sends out a man and he says to him, go over to the river, Jordan River, and, and do what? Wash yourself seven times. And what is, how, how, does, how does Naaman react to that? He was mad. He says, you know, I thought he'd come out and he'd clap his hands and wave his arms over me and heal me of my disease. You know, something like that. You know, it says in verse 12, he says, so he turned and went away in a rage. He was mad. Like, what, what, what? This is not healing. Go on. The, the rivers in Syria are way better than the Jordan. The Jordan rivers is the muddy, oh, I'm not even bothered. And I want us to think about verse 13. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Now, if, if, if we could say one thing about this whole series that we're going to spend here this, at this time today, some of you are going to say, well, he's not talking about any great thing. We know all of this. We've heard this before. But he is simply saying this, the servants turned to Naaman and they said, if he had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? And Naaman thought, well, okay, I can go over there. And he went down and he got down seven times in that river. And what happened? Came up how? Free of leprosy. I had a man that came to our guest house. His name was Charlie. 
Charlie had had two heart attacks, I mean two bypass operations, he'd had heart attacks, but two bypass operations and three stints in his heart. When he pulled into my yard, he'd sold his buffalo farm, he was a buffalo farmer, he had been to Weimar, he'd had, you know, he, he had he'd basically done everything he thought he knew how, and he came to the guest house. He drove into the yard, he had a fifth wheel behind his truck, he'd sold his farm, and he came to our guest house to die, exactly why he came. He came there to leave his wife. He knew us from before, and so he came here there to leave his wife, and he says, I'm not, he wasn't even going to purchase a new home. He was just going to simply die. On his dresser, he had a, a document that told him he could go over to Calgary, over in, our, in Canada. We have a place in Calgary where they're doing experimental medicine, injecting genetic material, new genetic material into hearts that are, have had it. And what they do, they inject this new genetic material in there, and somehow it regenerates... Uh, new cells and, and it tries to refurbish the heart. And he had this document on his, on his dresser and that was his one ray of hope. And I said, Charlie, why don't you just, let's get you on the program, let's get you started. He could hardly walk to his pickup. He was just, his head was down, he was depressed, discouraged, his heart was sometimes racing and sometimes going too slow. I mean, he was just, he was, he was an ill man. So we got him started. He stayed at the guest house October. He stayed there in November. He stayed there in December. He stayed right through Christmas. He was there in, in January. By February, he was doing so well, he went down to Kelowna and bought himself a home. And now he's walking an hour and a half a day and he hasn't even talking about any, all he, I mean, his doctor has got him off all his medications except for one and he, he just can't believe what's happened to him. And we didn't, you know, it wasn't some great thing we did. It was no, we didn't even get the injection in his heart, you know, with the new genetic material. What we did is we gave him some Simple things, simple things done over and over again brought about results. In 1984, when we first started the guest house, we had a lady that came to us, 63 years of age. She'd had three heart attacks. And when she came to us, her son, who is a doctor, sent his mother to the guest house. He says, Mom, there's nothing else I can do for you. Go to Silver Hills. So she came. And I remember the first time I went walking with her, I, 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 I got concerned. I was just starting out, and we were walking along, and I heard, <gasps> she's just breathing. I thought, wow, this lady, she's going she's gonna to explode on me. Slow down. <laughs> slow her down. Go slower. And we just kept walking. The end of the session, she went up to see her sisters. They were having a family reunion in Saskatchewan. And on the way to that, in, to, up into the hall where they're having the, the, the family reunion, this, there was six sisters in the family, these sisters were talking, well, this could be our last family gathering together as, as a group of sisters because Gladys has had three heart attacks, she probably won't make it this year. While they were walking into the hall, Gladys goes whizzing past them into the hall. And I said, who's that? Gladys, what happened to you? The next session I had all sisters, the whole family, all six sisters came to the next session and we had a time together. Gladys is still alive today. She's 86 years of age. We had another fellow that came in 1984. He had, was scheduled for a bypass operation. And he says, I want to go to the guest house. He came and he spent a month with us. He spent another month to cancel his bypass operation. He was 64 years of age. Today, he's still alive. He's 83, never had the bypass operation. He's 87, 87 years. He's never had the bypass operation. Changed his lifestyle. We've seen how it can change people's lives. The things that we're going to be talking about are simple, but it's like the servant said to Naaman, if the Lord had told you to do some great thing, would you have done it? All he's asking you to do is some simple things, and these simple things are the most powerful things. Well, this afternoon, that I means this morning, what we want to talk to you about is soothe and tranquilize your mind. What was the very first health lesson that you learned when you went to School, what was the very first health lesson you learned? You remember what it was? Sit up straight? Was that what it was? You remember that one? Anyone else? First health lesson you remember when you went to school. Some people tell me, well, wash your hands, right? Anything else? Brush your teeth? Yeah, these are all common things. But the one I want to talk to you about is the one that's sit up straight. Among the first things to be aimed at is a correct position both in sitting and in standing. Why? Why is it so important to sit up straight? Breathe. breathe properly? Okay, what else? Anything else? Really important. Sit up straight. Why? Better circulation? Okay. A doctor of physical therapy, Dr. Charles Thomas, taught me that 90% of all neck problems 
are posture problems. 90% of all neck problems are posture problems. In other words, we walk around with our face, he says we walk around with our face sticking out. See, we're watching the computer screen, right? We're watching the video. We're watching the neighbors, right? You know, we're looking for money. We're walking along looking, hey, you know how you walk? You walk along looking for money. You're always hoping, oh boy, that one day I'll find that money, see? So our head is thrown forward and we create an unnatural tension on the back of our neck. And that unnatural tension begins to tighten up these muscles and then we go to turn the car, you know, back up the car, turn our head, oh no, my neck, oh, I gotta go to the chiropractor. He said at rest, our head should be, our earlobe should dissect the shoulder, okay? Check your earlobe. It's pretty hard to see it, isn't it? Oh, you can look at the person beside you. How could you get your earlobe to dissect your shoulder if you wanted, how could you sit up straight? Well, first of all, it takes muscles to sit up straight, okay? And so if these muscles up in, the, up in here, these trapezius muscles that hold that head back, if they get weak, a tendency for our head to fall forward, how can we strengthen these muscles? How can we exercise these muscles? Well, one of the things we could do is what I call the ladies push. This isn't to denigrate anybody, but to do the ladies push up. You just get on your knees and do push ups. It's very easy to do. If you do it on your toes, it's a lot harder. But just simple push ups, you see, and you just, and it starts to strengthen these muscles right here. Now, I have people, you know what? These are so easy. I have people that try to do them, and what they do is they, they have never done any for 20 years, they haven't done one push up, but now all of a sudden, oh, these are easy. And they do 65. And they come to me the next day like this. I didn't work. Oh, I'm a wreck. Oh, no. Well, it's easy. You know, if you, if you haven't done something, don't do a lot of it all at once. Just like do five, you know, and then six the next day. And you work your way up. And maybe in a month's time, you could do 40 or 50. But not, you know, just because they're easy doesn't mean to say your body's going to be, you know, adapted to it. So, you know, develop. And then you're going to be able to hold your head up, see. And that's going to help to give you better posture. Shoulders start to come back and you start to have better posture, see? Now, what else does it do? Let's take a look. The lungs should be allowed the greatest freedom possible. See, when we get our proper posture, then we get a lot more room for our lungs here. It says here, the lungs should be allowed the greatest freedom possible. Their capacity is developed by free action. It is diminished if they are cramped and compressed, hence the ill effects of the practice so common, especially in sedentary pursuits of stooping at one's work. In this position, it is impossible to breathe deeply. Superficial breathing soon becomes a habit. The lungs lose their power to expand. So what? I have people, you know, and I, I get, teach health all over the place, and they say, oh, you guys, you know, you're always, I'm breathing, right? I'm breathing. What difference does it make whether my lungs can expand, right? What's sedentary work? What's that? What kind of work are we talking about? Inactive work. How, how many of you here are sedentary workers? Sitting in front of a computer. Yeah, there you go. It's just about all of us, right? It used to be when we started off at Silver Hills, we had uh, what we call fallers. These are guys who went out in the bush with power saws and they fell trees. And, you know, our country, we got all kinds of trees. They go out and fall trees and they hook up line chokers and skidders and all. Now in our country, I don't know what you have down here, but in our country, the fallers, they have faller bunchers. And they sit in a machine, and all they do is like this, you see? And then they have grapple skitters. They don't get off the skitter. The skitter just comes along with these two arms and grab up the logs, and away they go. And then they have tree processors. They don't have buckermen. They, they pick up, and they process the tree, cut it to length. And then they have button-top loaders. They put them on untouched by human hands. <laughs> tree, tree is delivered to the mill untouched by human hands. They run it to the sawmill, comes out the other end. The green chain's all automated, comes out, and it's, at, it's in the lumber yard, untouched by human hands. And so we have people, even loggers are getting out of shape. We have, they're sedentary workers. We sit, and we stoop, and we round our shoulders, and we compress our lungs, and we have superficial breathing. So what? Well, let me show you what. Let's take a look at it. I think I've got it here. Hopefully I can draw this big enough for us all to see. But here we have, if we take the chest cavity, there's two things going on in our chest cavity. What are they? We call this the thoracic cavity. What are the two things happening here in this thoracic cavity. What's going on? Okay, we got lungs. What else? What's the other thing? Aha! We have the lungs and the heart. And what are they? Working together as a team, see? The heart's pushing the blood out to the lungs to pick up 
oxygen and then it's going back to the heart to go out to the body with that oxygen. Isn't that what's going on? This is what's happening in the thoracic cavity. These are a team. Now what happens? The heart pushes the blood out to the lungs. How much of the lungs gets blood? There's a whole lesson. It's called perfect circulation. We haven't, we, we, we will, we'll do that another time. But anyway, the more perfect your circulation, the better your health is. And we have what we call an equal distribution system. Our body is working on an equal distribution system. In other words, every part of the body receives its share of the blood when the heart pushes out it, out the blood. See, every part should be entitled to it. If we, if we study out the body, we'll find out that it, every part of the body should be able to receive that blood. So when the heart pushes the blood out to the lungs, what part of the lungs does it push it to? All of it, right, there it is, all of it, equal distribution. So the blood goes everywhere. All of it. Superficial breathing, where does the oxygen go? Right here, right? Right here, that's it. Well, what about all the blood that went down here? When it goes back to the heart, has it got any oxygen? No. And when the heart pushes it out to the body, and the muscles are saying, well, thank you very much for that blood, but there's no, there's not, this is not oxygenated. Are you with me? See what's going on? Superficial breathing then is, who's hurting? What part is hurting the most? The heart. The heart has got to do more work because it's pushing blood out to the lungs to get oxygen. It's only getting oxygen at the top. And you know when I know that? When I get to the top of the stairs, I'm going, ah, oh boy, I'm just short of breath. Ah. Right? See what's going on? I'm getting short of breath because I'm not using the capacity of my lung. If I use the capacity of my lung, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to have a lot easier, my heart's going to have a lot easier time of it. My heart is going to have a lot less work. I mean, if I could use that capacity, then I'm going to get a much better oxygenation, which means my heart doesn't have to work as hard. So superficial breathing, and it says here the lungs losing their power to expand, becomes a serious problem when, I, when it becomes habitual to the point of losing the power to expand. All right, that's the first concept. The next one is this, how important is oxygen? Dr. Wilhelm Huper, this is a German scientist, what he wanted to do is he wanted to see, first of all, the brain cells that you have right now are the ones you were born with. Every other part of your body has been regrown many, many times over, but your brain, unfortunately, that's the one that, you know, it stays the same. Stays, <laughs> we've tried to change it many times, but that's our brain, right? And fortunately, because many of the things, we, the patterns that we learn, the habits we form, all of those kind of things, you wouldn't want them to grow right out of your brain. Well, some of them you might, but <laughs> some of them you want to keep them because it's, that's the way it's built. And so when we get to the brain cells, Dr. Wilhelm Huper, what he wanted to do is he wanted to prove that you could actually make brain cells divide and multiply, make new brain cells, just like every other cell of the body that divides and multiplies. And so what he simply did is he put bell jars like this, and he put petri dishes like this, and he put in there brain cells from rats, rats' brains, and he gave them stimuli and the right nutrition and he made them so that they would divide and multiply like every other cell in your body. So they actually grew new brain cells. Then he took those new brain cells and he grafted them back in the rat's brain. And he had a, rat here, a brain here rat. Now the problem was this, is he, he, when he was doing his experiments, sometimes the cells would not replicate, now listen to these words, they wouldn't replicate the parent cell, exact, make an exact copy, they would mutate, and he would take those mutated cells and he would graft them back into the rat's brain and guess what he got? What do you think happened? He got a what? A tumor, because that's what cancer cells are, they're cells that originally started off with their origin, but then they mutated and they started their own genetic pattern and they started making new cells not according to the original code, and he got tumors. What do you think it was that made it so that the cells would not replicate the parent cell? Simply all he had to do is reduce the amount of oxygen in the bell jars. If he reduced the amount of oxygen, the cells did not have the energy or the strength to replicate the parent cells. Are you with me? A lack of oxygen? Reduced lung capacity, not breathing deeply. Are you with me? What's going to start taking place? Uh, we can start seeing right away a lack of oxygen. I'm not saying is the only cause, but it's one of the causes of mutated cells. What is the number one thing in this country, our country is the same, that reduces oxygen in a person's tissue? The number one health habit that 
What is it? Smoking. What kind of cancer do we get? But I thought smoking reduced the oxygen to all the tissues of the body, didn't it? So a, can a smoker should actually have more liver cancer, bowel cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, skin cancer, shouldn't he? I mean, if smoking reduces oxygen, and, and oxygen is one of the causes, a lack of oxygen is one of the causes, then a smoker should actually hit, you know something? If you do the statistics, you go back and read the statistics, you'll find that a smoker heads every cancer, not just lung cancer. But smoking predisposes the body to every type of cancer because of a lack of oxygen. What else causes a reduction in oxygen? Common thing in our, in our Western civilization. What is it? A high, high fat, right. High fat diet. What does high fat do? Well, it does two things. It makes the blood sticky, but it also coats the red blood cells so they can't pick up as much oxygen. You see, they get all kind of sticky around the outside of them, and they don't pick up as much oxygen. So even though I'm pumping the blood out to my lungs to pick up oxygen, it's just not picking up as much. So a, a high fat diet reduces it. What else would we do that could reduce the amount of oxygen going into the tissue, into the lungs? Lack of, oh, that was a good one. Lack of exercise, there you go. Sedentary lifestyle, living inside, couch potatoing, you know, whatever, we got all kinds of names for it. But it's basically sitting, and we don't get the activity to get the oxygen. So there's uh, what we call that a lack. Of, if I went to the Canadian Cancer Society, and I'm sure it's the same here, and I asked them for the three main health habits that would lead to a cancer situation, you know what they would tell me? Right here. Smoking, high fat, lack of exercise. What are they saying? All the same thing. What are they saying? A lack of what? A lack of breathing properly. Are you with me? This is pretty simple. You know, we, it, we, we can, if we simplified it, and if we went to some of these places, now I'm not suggesting you do this, but if you went to some of these places in Mexico where they give what we would call innovative type treatments, one of them that they would give you would be uh, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, what is it? become when it goes into the bloodstream. It becomes oxygen. Another thing they might do for you is they might give you um, hyperbaric oxygen chamber or ozone. You've heard of this, ozone creams and suppositories and, and ozone is oxygen three. It's another form of oxygen. Or they might give you a whole lot of herbs to cleanse the blood so that your blood can carry more oxygen. Are you with me? It's, we're again going back, back to oxygen being so important. So, the one who sits and stands erect is more likely than others to breathe properly, but the teacher should impress upon his pupils the importance of what? Deep breathing. I don't know if you remember school. When I went to school, it was 1955. I hate to admit this because anybody's going to start figuring out how old I am. But anyway, when I went to school, it was 1950. It was right after the Second World War, and all of my teachers, male teachers, had done a tour of duty in the military. They walk with their shoulders back and chest out, you know, and they wanted us to be, it was like this, you see. And they would, every once in a while, bring the pointer down on the desk with a real whack like that, and they'd say, sit up straight, bang, and we'd, you know, we weren't breathing at all, believe me, we were just, <laughs> it says here the teacher should impress upon his pupils the importance of what? Deep breathing, exactly, we want to do this deep breathing. Why? Because the healthy action of the respiratory organs does what? assists the circulation of the blood. Are you with me? Did we already describe that? In other words, when I've got my lungs working right, then my heart is working right. Are you with me? If I've got my lungs working right, then my heart is, oh, you know, I have people go out on the nature trail. We got nature trails at the guest house. We got 90 acres. We have people go out and walk on the nature. And I have people after they've been there for three or four days, sometimes a week, they'll come back to me and they say, you know, I got my second wind. Have you ever heard of that? What are they talking about? Their heart and their lungs are starting to work together as a team finally. Isn't that neat? Now all of a sudden it just seems like they're just flooded with oxygen. Every time they take a breath, they're getting all this oxygen. Oh, they can just go and go and go. Because really what it is, their muscles need is oxygen to be able to turn those sugars into energy, you see. And so now they've got that oxygen. Now they're really making headway. And so it says here, the first thing that happens is the healthy action of the respiratory organs assisting the circulation of the blood Folks, if you, if you know anything else about health, the foundation principle is perfect circulation is perfect health. 
If you've got a disease or a diseased organ or a disease in the body, you've got to restore the normal circulatory pathways. The first things that breathing does is it assists that job. Second thing it says is it invigorates the whole system. Now we say invigorating the whole system. What does it mean? How does it invigorate the whole system? Well, first of all, did you know you're on fire? I know you don't feel like it sometimes. <laughs> Feels like the fire went out, right? Or it's just smoldering. But every bit of food that you had for breakfast and lunch, your body, we call it metabolizes it, but it actually is burning it. That's what it's doing. It's actually burning it. And it requires oxygen to burn. If you want to, if, at our place, we heat a lot of our buildings with wood, wood heat. If we want the fire to go out, all we do is just take the draft and shut it off, right? Turn the draft down. What happens to the fire? Down it goes. There goes the heat. All you have to do is just pinch your nose, hold your nose long enough, and guess what? The fire will go out. There goes the energy. If we get lots of oxygen into our system, then what happens? Now we're going to get lots of energy. We're going to start feeling energetic, see? And that's what we're really talking about, that it invigorates the whole system. The next thing it does is it excites the appetite. And boy, I wish I didn't have to read this. This is, this is inspiration. I have to read it anyway. But you know something? If you go out skating or skiing in the wintertime or go out exercising or something like that, you come back and you'll eat just ordinary, ordinary food, won't you? And you'll have a good appetite. But when you're not exercising and you're sitting around, you start picking. Well, I don't know. I don't. Eh, it's got a, well, it doesn't have enough flavor. Well, put a little more sauce on it. You know, it, your appetite's not as vigorous. You see. But when you go out and do some good outdoor exercise, get some fresh air, get invigorated, then you feel like you have an ordinary good. You can eat just ordinary food and it tastes good. So that, that's the kind of appetite we're talking about. Okay. The next thought is is that it promote. How does breathing promote digestion? Now here's a tough one. How does breathing promote digestion? I mean, your stomach is down here in your ab abdomen, right? How does, how, I mean, how does, how does it, I mean, do you get, a, you get a mouthful of air and it makes you, how does it work? First of all, how does the food, you have a 30 foot long digestive tract. This is a long piece of equipment. Now, how does the food move in that digestive tract? Sometimes that digestive tract goes uphill and it goes around here and it goes over there. How does the food move through that pipe? I mean, if you had to kind of go like this all the time to get it to go, I mean, that's not, how does it go? Call, call, you got the right word. You said peristalsis, exactly. Some people don't have a peristalsis, you know, they have a stalsis. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. What hap actually happens is the muscles contract and they move the food through the tube. See, they actually move it through the tube. Now, don't anybody put up your hand. Have you ever gone to a potluck? and ate so much that nothing seemed to be moving, you know? Oh, oh man, ooh, that was that, that second one, that, oh, that third plateful, oh. <laughs> you ever feel that way? You know, it just feels like it's, oh, solid, right? Nothing's going anywhere. You wish you could find a hand railing and kind of lean over it and kind of bounce a bit, you know, kind of get this thing going. You know, Dr. Kellogg actually made a machine that he strapped on the back of his, of his uh, guests, some of them, and it, would, it actually had two little mechanical arms that would massage the abdomen like this, you see. So that person, some people, I've had them come to my guest house. They are, their, their stomach has become so sensitive. They're under so much stress that their stomach has become so sensitive that when they sit down to eat, their stomach, one bite, they just swallow one bite and there's a blah. And the stomach just goes like cast iron. It won't move. So he made a little machine. It would go like this, you see. And it was massage, right? And it would keep them going and they would go, Doctor, another doctor friend of mine told me, if you've got a person with all these allergies and everything like that, get them to eat and then walk until the pain goes away. And the reason is, is because the exercise will start drawing the blood away from all that congestion and it will start massaging the abdomen. It says here that deep breathing does what? When we do deep breathing, the diaphragm comes down and it bumps the stomach, you see. And before you know it, we're ready for another plate of food. You know, things are starting to move through, you see. So this is actually, it's that deep breathing, it's that movement of the diaphragm coming down and bumping against the intestinal tract that actually starts this peristalsis up again and gets the food moving. So deep breathing actually assists the digestion of the food. Now last but not least, it induces sound, sweet sleep, soothing and tranquilizing the mind. You know, when I first learned this, I, was, I went down to Alabama to Uchi Pines to listen to a Dr. Thrash do some lecturing. 
And, uh, you know, I wanted to, I, I don't know about you, but when I listened to health lecturing, I wanted, I got out my pen and I started writing vigorously. I wanted to get all those words, you know, triglycerides and HDL, high density lipoproteins. Can you imagine lipoproteins, learning all these words? I like words and I was writing all this stuff down and boy, I was learning so much stuff and I was, man, I was going to be a scientist and a doctor and, a, and all this. And then she started talking about deep breathing. Oh, boring. And I thought, well, I breathe every 14 times a minute, and I don't need to even think about it, so why, you know, why even listen to this? So I went, we went back to Silver Hills. And when we got back there, we were living down the hill in a little two-story house. Yeah, that's where we started the guest house. And uh, we started, it to, 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 before we started the guest house, we started a committee. How many of you have sat on a committee? Anybody here sat on a committee? How about our board or something like that? What do they talk about? What do they usually talk about? What's that? Well, listen, I'm telling you, we had this committee meeting, and we would meet once a week. We would work endlessly, you know, cutting down trees and cutting them up to build the buildings and all this kind of stuff. I mean, work, 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 work. Dog, tired, deadbeat, and we go to a committee meeting, and you know what they used to talk about? The lack of money. And the money that we didn't have was spent by somebody who wasn't supposed to have spent it again. And we're, it, it was always bleak. It was always so bleak, you know. And I go home after the committee meeting, and I get into bed, and it, here comes the problem. I was exhausted. Here comes the problem. Zero, bong, like that. Another problem. Zero, bong. I turn over, turn this way, turn. I couldn't get away. The problems just seemed to get worse. Now, the tireder I was, the worse the problems seemed to be. There is absolutely nothing worse than going to bed, knowing you have to get up the next day, and you can't go to sleep. Have you ever had that? I mean, there's not, that, I don't think there's anything worse. I, I, this is like a torture. I mean, I, I know I've been, and, and you're, uh, tomorrow, oh, I'm going to be a wreck. Oh, it's going to be worse tomorrow. I got to get to go to sleep. You can't be, I can't go to sleep. So what do you think I did? I got out of bed. That's the worst thing you could do. My wife says to me, what are you doing? I said, I can't sleep. Are you going to jump? No, honey, I'm not going to jump. I'm just, there's only two stories, you know. I'm gonna... Well, get in the bed. Well, I was just in bed. <laughs> Well, get in bed. So I got back in bed. What do you think she did? Went right back to sleep. You know, her job's done. I'm back in bed. Now I can't get out. I'm stuck. I can't get out of bed. I can't get away from the problems. I'm stuck in bed. I can't go to sleep. Then I remember what Dr. Thrash said. Deep breathing. Breathe in through your nose. Count to 20. Purse your lips. Blow it all out. Breathe in through your nose. Count to 20. Purse your lips. Blow it all out. I thought, oh, I can do that. I won't even wake up my wife. So that's what I started doing, this deep breathing. And here I am, deep breathing, you see. Now, how do you count? She said, do it 30 times. Now, how do you count to 30 in the dark? I mean, I can't write it on a paper. I mean, what can you do? I started using my hands. I got one, two, three, four. Got up to 10. Then I got to 11. Then I got to 12. And you know what happened? I couldn't remember which hand I was counting them on. Was it this hand or that? I fell asleep. <laughs> it says here it does what? It induces what? Sound, sweet sleep. What does? Deep breathing. That's what I was doing, deep breathing, and I fell asleep. Well, you know something I got good at? I started looking forward to committee nights. Go ahead, throw the problems at me. I can go to sleep anyway. I don't care, you see. I can sleep anyway. Now, what is deep breathing? Let's, let's do that. Let's, let's do a little uh, lesson on that one. First of all, where does the air go? Oh, boy. I better hurry up and write this down. Where's my pen? I'll put it in here. So here we go. Here's the, here's the oh, person's nose, chin. There we go. Now, this is not meant to be a copy of anybody here, so you can relax. All right, so here we have the lungs right down here, right? So where does the air go in? How do we take the air in? Through your what? Why? Why your nose? Ah, I, got, I like it. There it is. It's a filtration system. You got nose hairs. See, if your nose was like this, right, what would happen? All the dust particles would fall in there, right? People would look in, right? <laughs> Aren't you glad you're, it's the way it is? That, that way the dust falls down. This is a filtration system. It's got nose hairs. It's got sticky mucus up in here that traps all the fine particles. It's got hairs that are on the, on the inside of the, the trachea, little tiny cilia, that help to sweep, sweep out the dust. See? If we smoke one cigarette, you know what happens? It paralyzes these little ha hairs for two hours. 
So the dust gets by there. What happens is when the dust gets by there, it gets down and it irritates the bronchial tubes. The bronchial tubes cry. When they cry, the water runs down into the alveoli. In your lungs, the lung, if we took the lung, it's about two square yards. But if we actually looked inside the lung, the lung is actually filled with grape-like structures that increase the surface area of the lung to 2,000 square feet. So our, our lung surface capacity for ch exchanging carbon dioxide with oxygen is 2,000 square feet because of these alveoli. But when we smoke, the, the dust particles get down, irritate these bronchial tubes, the water runs down into the alveoli and it starts to fill them up. And you can hear that with a stethoscope on a person's lung and that person has what that's called bronchitis. Smokers typically have chronic bronchitis and when they wake up in the morning, what does the smoker usually do? He starts to cough and he doesn't just go, ah, to clear his throat. What does he do? <laughs> right? Smoker's cough, we call it. When he has that smoker's cough, water is incompressible. That's how he can run steam engines. And it busts these little alveoli. They actually break. The disease now goes from chronic bronchitis to a disease we call emphysema. And simply what's happened here is the person has broken the little air sacs and they've created openings in the lungs where there's no exchange with oxygen and carbon dioxide. That person now is compromised in their breathing and is a prisoner in their own body. That's what we call it. Well, what is deep breathing? Let's do it quickly. We've got a few minutes here left. Deep breathing, first of all, there are no muscles in the lungs themselves. No muscles at all. They're just two bags in your chest. How do you get air into them? When I take a lineup of, uh, I see some young people coming in here, I line up a, a line of boys, grade five, give me your deepest breath. What do you think they do? They always do the same thing, grade five. They go like this. I don't know why they go up on their toes, but somehow, you know, up here and up goes the shoulders and boy, you know, chest out. Now the deepest breath, folks, is right down here. Now, what you want to have is that diaphragm to drop because when the diaphragm drops, it sucks the air into a negative pressure in the chest cavity. So you want that diaphragm to drop. If you put your hand on your abdomen right now. And we're going to just do a couple deep breaths. Put your hand on your abdomen. Okay, so if we're going to breathe in through our nose, I'll do the counting. See if you can move your hand out when the air comes in and then make your hand go in when the air goes out. So let's breathe in. In. Hold. Purse your lips, blow it all out. In. Hold. Purse your lips, blow it all out. In. Hold. Purse your lips, blow it all out. Okay, just breathe normally now. Some people ask me, how did you count to 20 so fast? Well, I used to play hide and seek, didn't you? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's the kind, that's, it's called hide and seek counting. That's what you want to do. You don't want to do one steamboat, two steamboats, you'll be run out of air. You won't get there, see? So you want to get, it's only a count of 20 and it's to slow you down. That's the only reason. We want to slow you down so that you get what we call deep breathing and you start getting more oxygenation. Now folks, I want you to try this. Not during a time when you're going to go to sleep. You can do that anytime you want. Sometime in the middle of the day, lay on your back, on your bed, make sure there's fresh air in the room, windows, in, I mean, in, knees in an upright position, which is a relaxing for your back. You can put a pillow under your knees if you want. Do 30 deep breaths, just like I taught you. In through your nose. Now the most important part of the bre deep breathing is the breathing out. You cannot get air into a lung that's half full of residual air. So blowing it out, purse your lips. What does it mean to purse your lips? You know when you take money out of your purse, you know how you do it? You're tight, right? That's it. Tighten up right here. You tighten up, purse your lips, then you blow that air out like that, trying to bring that diaphragm up. That's called diaphragmatic breathing. When you start doing this deep breathing, you're going to find that it does well, exactly what it says here. It soothes and tranquilizes the mind. 
Deep breathing is the one thing that we can do. Folks, it was the most important lesson that I learned when I went down to Uchi Pines. I thought it was the most unimportant. It was the most important. If I have guests that come to our place that have intractable pain, I teach them deep breathing. They're able to tolerate the pain better. If they're having insomnia, here's a guarantee for you. So you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, wide awake. Oh, wow, wide awake. And you're going to do problem solving. This is a good time. No phones, nobody to interrupt you. Man, you can get in there and do some problem solving. And there you are doing your problem solving. And then all of a sudden you get that little kind of flutter in your tummy thinking, oh, I wish I, I should go back to sleep. But, I, I, you know, when you get that flutter feeling that you think you should go back to sleep, that's when you start your deep breathing. As long as you're doing your problem solving, go right ahead. You can have fun doing that. But with the, as soon as you start feeling like, I wish I could go back to sleep, start your deep breathing. And when you start your deep breathing, guess what will happen? You'll start relaxing. And if you deep breathe from 4 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the morning, I guarantee, here's a guarantee, you will be more refreshed than if you fell asleep. And you will never, ever be worried about not sleeping again. Once you learn this, if you deep breathe from 4 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock, you'll never have anxiety over not going to sleep again. You'll be over that forever because you'll find that relaxation. Okay, two more thoughts and then we'll finish up here. The air we breathe is more important than the food we eat. The air we breathe is more important than the food we eat. You know, when I run a health retreat, everybody wants to know what's on the table, what are you guys going to feed us, you know, oh boy. I have people that actually sneak chocolate bars into the guest house, you know. Make sure just in case the food doesn't taste good. <laughs> the air we breathe is what? More important than the food we eat, okay? And here's the last thought. This is a little bit of a negative thought, but it gets us going. This is what happens when you don't get enough oxygen. Thus, an insufficient supply of oxygen is received. The blood moves sluggishly. The waste poisonous matter, which should be thrown off in the exhalations of the lungs, is retained. The blood becomes impure. Not only the lungs, but the stomach, liver, and brain are affected. The sin, skin becomes sallow. The digestion is retarded. The heart is depressed. The brain is clouded. The thoughts are confused. Gloom settles upon the spirits. The whole system becomes depressed, inactive, and peculiarly susceptible to disease. Oh, boy. Ugh. Isn't that something? Listen to that. The skin becomes sallow. Digestion is retarded. Heart is depressed. Brain is clouded. Thoughts are confused. So I meet this person, I say, let's go for a walk. And they come back and they give me a great big hug. Phil, oh, you saved my life. I feel so, you're just a fabulous. It wasn't me. What was it? It was the air in their body. You're an air-breathing creature. You need air. Learn to love it, folks. Learn to deep breathe. The deep breathing that you do today, you'll come back a year from now and tell me I'm, deeping, I'm breathing much deeper now than I was a year ago, and a year later you'll be breathing that much deeper using more and more capacity of your lung. Your brain uses five times more oxygen than in any other part of your body for its weight. Your nervous system needs more oxygen. Any part of your body is going to achieve the greatest amount of benefit. It's going to be your brain and nerves from deep breathing.